So the early signs and symptoms of non-Hodgkin lymphoma is usually a lump, uh, and that lump is often felt in the neck or in the armpit or in the groin, and that lump is an enlarged lymph gland. It's usually painless. Some people describe it as feeling rubbery, and it's almost sometimes like sort of mar a feeling of marbles um, in your neck or, as I say, in the armpit or the groin. That's the commonest, but there can be many other ways that people come to us. Sometimes those enlarged lymph glands happen in places that you can't feel. So for example, if you get enlarged lymph glands in the tummy, you might get some sort of vague abdominal discomfort. Uh, it could, one of those lumps could maybe block the outflow of the bile. So somebody might become jaundiced or um, perhaps you might have a lump in the chest, one of those enlarged lymph nodes in the chest. And so you might get some chest discomfort or cough or even breathlessness. And sometimes as well, people don't come with symptoms of a lump, but actually they come with general what we call systemic symptoms. So drenching night sweats or profound fatigue or unexpected weight loss um, or a fever uh, of unknown cause. So it's really a lump, a consequence of a lump inside or uh, these systemic symptoms. There are many different types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. It can be quite complicated if a patient's just been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma and they go on to Google, it can be very confusing. But in broad terms, there's something called high-grade or aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma or low-grade or indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Those are the two main types. And then there are different subtypes within each of those sort of buckets. So the commonest high-grade or aggressive uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma that we see is something called diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Um, and the typical characteristics of high-grade um, non-Hodgkin lymphomas, as, as it suggests, it's relatively quick. So if the patient has a lump, it can grow quite quickly. If we, if we were to do nothing about it, then patients become unwell quite quickly. And some people with high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma actually come through A&E. You know, they get so unwell that they need emergency treatment. Um, whereas low-grade or indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma, quite often it's just a lump that somebody's found. They feel very well. They go to their family doctor. They're referred for a biopsy. And lo and behold, they have low-grade lymphoma. Now, actually, with low-grade lymphoma, if we do nothing about it, then often patients remain well for many years. And indeed, one of the sort of main management strategies of low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma is just to keep an eye on it, something called watch and wait or active surveillance. Whereas with high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma, we get on and treat it. The, the sort of benefit, if I can put it like that, of having high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma is that the treatments often work very well. And indeed, we manage to cure about two-thirds of patients. Whereas with low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the treatments also work very well, but we generally don't cure it. So people can get in remission for many, many years, but it does come back. So um, they're, they're really very different uh, conditions, high grade and low grade. So there are many different potential treatment options for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and it really depends on a, a few factors. It depends on the type, the subtype of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, that uh, the patient comes to us with. It depends on the stage, in other words, where in their body is being affected with the non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And it also depends on patient factors themselves. You know, how fit are they? Can they tolerate intensive treatment or do we need to go more gently? I'll just give you maybe some examples. So generally speaking, high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma, if we can, we treat with combinations of chemotherapy drugs, often combined with an antibody treatment called rituximab, and the aim is to cure it. So patients will have a number of cycles of chemotherapy, often given once every three weeks, typically for six cycles, and the aim is to get rid of it completely. And we managed to do that in about two thirds of cases. So, you know, roughly 60 to 70% of people who um, receive first line treatment are cured of their disease with that first line treatment. If it comes back, patients often then re receive further chemotherapy, um, and often with other types of treatments, such as CAR T cell therapy, which is actually a genetically modified immune system cell, uh, which we take from the patient, we genetically modify it and give it back to the patient. And it goes on a sort of search and destroy mission to then find the lymphoma and kill it. And that can be a really good treatment for relapsed high grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Stem cell transplantation can also be another quite intensive, but sometimes effective treatment. Uh, for those patients. For the more indolent or low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphomas, yes, we still sometimes use chemotherapy with antibody treatments, but it's usually less intensive. It's usually a milder form of treatment, slight, slightly better tolerated. There are still some side effects, but perhaps less marked. Uh, in patients with low-grade early stage disease, perhaps where it's only affecting one site in the body, then actually just giving fairly low doses of radiotherapy can be very, very effective at 
um, inducing long remissions and potential cures uh, in some patients. And more and more in the low-grade lymphomas, particularly at relapse, uh, there are non-chemotherapy options such as targeted treatments. There's something, for example, called ibrutinib or acalabrutinib, which is a, 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 a pill. Uh, you take it daily and it's a targeted treatment. So it, it doesn't it, it has a reduced number of side effects, um, a, a less of an impact on non-affected tissues in the body. So we don't really know what causes the vast majority of cases of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. There's been a lot of research uh, done looking at it, but most of it's drawn a blank. So, you know, smoking, that causes a lot of cancers, but it is not associated with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Similarly, alcohol, similarly, sunlight exposure, you know, all these things have been linked with cancers, but not with non-Hodgkin lymphoma. There are certain subtypes of non-Hodgkin lymphoma where we can say, ah, oh, we know what's causing it. So the classic one here is something called gastric malt lymphoma, which affects the stomach. It's a low grade lymphoma of the stomach. And there's a bacteria called H. pylori, which often causes stomach ulcers, but it can in some people cause gastric malt lymphoma. That's important for us to know because actually people with gastric malt lymphoma, the best treatment is actually antibiotics. So we can cure their cancer with antibiotics, not with chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So in that very rare example, uh, it is, it, it's a very specific causative factor. There are some other risk factors though, which can apply in some patients. So people who have relatively suppressed immune systems are more likely to develop non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So people with HIV, for example, or uh, people who've had an organ transplant in the past and are on drugs to suppress their immune system, they're at particular risk. Perhaps more common though are people with um, perhaps rheumatoid arthritis or autoimmune conditions, they often take medicines that slightly suppress the immune system. And there is a slightly increased risk of non-Hodgkin lymphoma uh, in those patients. So in terms of preventing non-Hodgkin lymphoma, actually, we don't know how to prevent non-Hodgkin lymphoma because we don't know what causes it. And that is a bit of a problem. Uh, what I would say, though, is the key to um, successful outcomes with non-Hodgkin lymphoma is earlier diagnosis. So really, if a patient notices a lump or the sort of cardinal features of drenching night sweats, fever of unknown cause, which isn't an infection or weight loss, which is unintentional, it's really important to seek help early because it's easier to treat people if they're well at diagnosis with earlier stage disease. It becomes harder uh, if people are less well with later stage disease. So whilst we can't prevent non-Hodgkin lymphoma, early diagnosis is the key. So non-Hodgkin lymphoma is actually a very exciting area to work in because there have been lots and lots of developments in drugs and therapeutics in that area. Um, traditionally, and we still do, rely on combinations of chemotherapy and monoclonal antibodies in the first line treatment. However, when uh, or if indeed lymphomas relapse, that's really where more targeted therapies come uh, into play. So first of all, there are drugs uh, which you take by mouth, so pills, which contain small molecules which are designed to target specific aspects of the machinery of lymphoma cells and to sort of interfere with that machinery and to cause the cells to die. So a typical example here would be something called a BTK inhibitor, such as ibrutinib or acalabrutinib. These are very effective in certain types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, so relapsed mantle cell lymphoma or Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, or chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is really a, a type of low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Those are all very sensitive to the uh, effects of these BTK inhibitors. However, what's really impacted the field recently are immunotherapy approaches. So there is, for example, uh, there are uh, um, fairly new agents called bispecific antibodies. Now, what are bispecific antibodies? Well, a normal antibody um, has two arms, and usually each of those arms binds the same thing. So binds the same protein on the surface of a cell. However, it's now possible to make antibodies in the laboratory, which bind different things on each arm. So one arm binds an immune system cell called a T cell, and the other arm binds the cancer cell, the lymphoma cell. And by doing that, that, and that bispecific antibody brings the immune system to the lymphoma cell and helps the immune system to kill it. And these are really very effective in both relapsed uh, high grade and low grade uh, non Hodgkin lymphomas. Um, we've seen some approvals now um, so that we can use these agents uh, in some patients. And they're really revolutionizing actually how we treat relapsed 
cases, often multiply relapsed cases of both high and low grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And then another therapy, which I really must mention, which again is a type of immune therapy, is this therapy called CAR-T therapy. Now, this is a totally new way of treating patients. Basically, what you do is it's possible to take out uh, from patients a sample of T cells. T cells are part of your immune system. Um, it's, it's a very straightforward process taking out um, T cells. We then send those T cells off to a pharmaceutical company who genetically engineer them so that instead of recognizing uh, sort of bacteria and viruses, which is what they normally do, they actually recognize the patient's lymphoma. Uh, they're grown up in the laboratory, sent back. We then treat the patient with some preparatory chemotherapy to make room for those uh, genetically engineered T cells. Those are then reinfused into the patient, just a bit like having a blood transfusion. And then they go on a seek and destroy mission to find the lymphoma and attack it. And these are particularly helpful in relapsed high grade non Hodgkin lymphoma, but they also have activity in low grade as well. Um, th there are some issues, I should say, with CAR T cells. They sound like a sort of wonder drug. There are some problems. There are side effects of what's called cytokine release syndrome and even neurotoxicity, where the brain can be temporarily affected. Thankfully, it is temporary. Um, and they can also suppress the immune system in the longer term. So there are uh, certain drawbacks to these. But again, it has um, the introduction of CAR T cell therapy has led to real improvements in outcome in certain high risk patients.